Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Mrs. Gallup taught first and second grade Sunday school at St. Peter's Lutheran Church forever. <laughs> forever. Forever. Well, I think when I had her as a teacher, she'd already been teaching about 100 years. Um, and I was in her class in the mid-70s. So out of curiosity, I Googled her name this week, and I discovered that her obituary from 2003. And it turns out that Mrs. Gallup died when she was 95 years old. So when I had her as a teacher, she was in her mid-60s. I understand that isn't old now. <laughs> well, I gotta tell you, she looked very old. <laughs> Wouldn't you say, Mom? Yeah, she looked old. Um, and <clears throat> Mrs. Gallup had a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. Her classroom was full of stuff. Her car was full of stuff. Her home was full of stuff. Her husband slept outside, I kid you not. <clears throat> <clears throat> right, Mom? Her husband slept outside. This was well before we used the term hoarder, but she was. During church work days, Mrs. Gallup's classroom was off limits. Nobody was allowed to go in there and touch any of her stuff or deal with anything. So all, while all the other classrooms and all the other spaces were getting cleaned and some of them were getting painted and updated, not Mrs. Gallup's classroom. Do not touch her stuff. It remained the same forever. It was the only classroom at the, at the church that had desks in rows. Just like you had in school. But we loved Mrs. Gallup. We loved her because among all that stuff she had were prizes and treats and toys and pencils and erasers. And she always had animal crackers. <laughs> or cookies. Whatever. I think we just call them crackers. That made us feel better. And she rewarded us for everything we did. She gave us a prize for showing up. She gave us a prize for being good. She gave us a prize for answering questions. She was a very sweet and affirming teacher. And she taught us things I still remember today. Things like the Ten Commandments and the Lord's Prayer. Obviously, for a prize, you can learn a lot. But it seemed to have worked. We loved Mrs. Gallup. When did you learn the Lord's Prayer? Who taught it to you? Do you still remember it? Anybody want to recite it for a prize? <laughs> it's a little intimidating to do it alone in front of a whole room full of people, or it can be. Do we pray the Lord's Prayer in the way that you learned it? Do we use all the same words you learn to say when praying? Do we pray with the same rhythm, the same pauses, the same speed? Are you one of those people who misses the thys and the thous? Or have you grown accustomed to our more modern, certainly not the most modern, but our more modern way of praying the Lord's Prayer? Does it matter to you which version we pray? There are a lot. Do you think it matters to God? On this Holy Trinity Sunday, we are beginning a four-week sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. And this prayer was given to the disciples by Jesus, which is why it's called the Lord's Prayer. But really now it's given to us to be our prayer. The Lord's Prayer can be found in two places. It can be found in Matthew's Gospel, which we read from this morning and in Luke's gospel, in Matthew, it's found as, <coughs> pardon me, as part of the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount begins in Matthew 5 with the Beatitudes, blessed are those, blessed are those, blessed, blessed. And uh, concludes in chapter 7. So it's about the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And in Luke's gospel, it can be found in chapter 11, beginning with the second verse. Luke, in Luke chapter 1, we read that one of Jesus' disciples said to Jesus, can you teach us to pray like John taught his disciples? And in response, Jesus said, told them to pray like this. And he offered them the Lord's Prayer. 
Now the two versions of the Lord's Prayer that we find in Matthew and Luke are not the same. They're very similar, but they're not identically the same or exactly the same. Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer is much shorter than Matthew's is. And that's led some people to believe that that Luke's version was first and Matthew's came later because Matthew would have added to what Luke had already recorded and filled it out a little. Other scholars think that Matthew came first and Luke wanted to be briefer and make it easier to remember. (laughs) And he took some words out. But what we do know, we don't know which was first, there's different theories, but what we do know is that both versions were given by Jesus to the disciples. And we know that they were given by Jesus to the disciples as a model. A model for how to pray. When praying, pray like this, Jesus said. Not in these exact words, because if we wanted to pray exactly as as Jesus had taught, we would all have to learn Aramaic. Anybody Know any Aramaic? Yeah, me either. So of course, the words we're using are not the exact words Jesus used to begin with. But we pray using this prayer as an outline, as a structure, as a reminder of how it is we should pray. The first petition, which we read from Matthew, reminds us of who we are praying to. But before Jesus told those gathered on the mount who they were praying to, And how to begin their prayer, he started by telling them how not to pray, which was the beginning of our reading this morning. When you are praying, he began, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. He explains to them that if they think that they should be using big, fancy words to pray to God, they shouldn't. They shouldn't be worried about that. They shouldn't worry about the the words they use when praying to God because big, fancy words aren't going to impress God. And if you're using them, you're probably trying to use them to impress others who might hear you praying. And that's not the point. Do not be like them, Jesus says, because your Father already knows what you need before you ask. Our prayer should not be an effort to butter up God as if doing so would give us a better chance of being heard, our prayers instead should be from the heart, acknowledging the relationship that we have with God, who is our Father, our Creator, our Provider. And God knows what we need before we ask. God knows what we need before we ask. Jesus doesn't say that God knows what we want before we ask, but that God knows what we need. And that, my friends, is God's concern. What we need. So when we pray, we approach God in that posture. We humbly ask God, who is the provider of every good and perfect thing, for what we need, not for what we want. And we don't worry about praying in Aramaic because we don't need to. We don't worry about praying in tongues unless unless we have been given the gift of tongues because we don't need to. We pray in the language of each of our hearts with the words that make sense to us because through those words we connect personally with God. Those words may not resonate with others, but that's okay. You're not praying to the people in the pews next to you. You're not praying to the people in your small group. You're not praying with the people in your family. You're praying to God. And God hears your words, understands your words, because they are your words and they resonate with God, because they come from your heart. So don't worry about how you sound to others. Worry about how you sound to God and acknowledge God as your provider. Jesus then says, pray in this way. And he identifies the one as we pray to as being Father. Father. Jesus is the first person recorded in Scripture as referring to God as Father. Because in fact, the the Jews who many of Jesus' followers were or had been, wouldn't even use the name of the Lord out loud. They wouldn't say Yahweh. 
They wouldn't write Yahweh. They would write it just the consonants without the vowels because they didn't think they were worthy to write the name of God or to say the name of God. In fact, rather than saying God's name, rather than saying Yahweh, they referred to God as Hashem, the name, meaning the name that they aren't worthy of uttering. So they called God Hashem because they weren't worthy of calling God God. And now Jesus has the audacity to tell them when praying to refer to God, the one whose name you can't utter as Father. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how difficult that would have been for them to hear and to begin to process? I had a friend in seminary who prayed to God as Abba Daddy. Abba Daddy. Made me comfortable, uncomfortable every time she did it. Because I just didn't, I mean, those words didn't connect for me. They weren't words from my heart in that, that relationship. But they very much, she was, she was a very spirit-filled, filled, prayerful person. And she prayed to Abba Daddy. And it made me uncomfortable. I can't imagine how uncomfortable the Jews would have been when Jesus said, pray to God as Father. But that's in fact what he did to demonstrate the intimacy of the relationship that we are invited to have with God. Radical. And that we are to see God as our provider, our nurturer, our creator, the one to whom we can and should turn to for all of our needs. And we continue. Then we pray that God's name, Hashem, might be hallowed. Luther writes in the small catechism, it is true that God's name is holy in itself. But we ask in this prayer that we might also, that it may also become holy in and amongst us. It's true that God's name is holy in and of itself, but we pray in this prayer that it might become holy in and among us. That we might revere the name of God whom our ancestors didn't even feel worthy to say or write out. And then we pray that God's kingdom might come and God's will be done here on earth as is as it is in heaven. I think it's this part of the prayer that really is where we acknowledge that that God provides for our needs and not our wants. As we pray for God's will, we are praying that our needs might be met because God's will is that all of God's creation would flourish. God's will is that all that God created would flourish. So when we pray for God's will to be done, we're praying that all of God's creation would flourish. Not that we would all have as we want, but that we would all have as we need. And that there might truly someday be peace on earth. It's a big prayer. So how does this get played out day to day? When we pray that God's will be done, Jesus... We pray just as Jesus did in the garden prior to his arrest and crucifixion. Do you remember that prayer when Jesus prayed on uh, Monday, Thursday? He'd gone out into the garden to pray and he said that if it be your will, may this cup pass from me. That he wouldn't have to drink this cup of suffering, allow himself to be arrested and crucified. And then he said, not my will, but thine be done. Even Jesus prayed that the will of God, his father, would be done. So what does this look like, practically speaking? Um, In our family, a a few weeks ago, Robin's dad was in the hospital. And uh, he was in the hospital for about 10 days. And on a particularly bad day that he was having, Robin's mom was filling us in on what was going on and Uh, with his precarious uh, health situation at the time. We happened to be in Atlanta helping our daughter and son-in-law move as she was giving us the update. The truth of the matter is, she didn't tell us until after we got there how bad it actually was. And uh, she's letting us us know that uh, um, how precarious things are. I asked her, finally, I said, well, how would you want us to pray? How should we be praying we see his kidneys were beginning to fail and they thought he might need to go on dialysis. His heart was, was uh, only functioning at about 20% and he's on oxygen 100% of the time. 
So she asks us to pray for God's best for him. God's best for him. Thy will be done. Robin's dad was eventually released from the hospital after 10 days. He's been in rehab for a couple of weeks. And he will likely get to go home this week. But he hasn't received any medical miracles. Medically speaking, he is still in very poor shape. His his still on oxygen, his heart is still weak, his kidneys, he he needs enough fluid to keep his kidneys functioning, but not enough fluid that his heart is overburdened by the fluids around his heart. And um, he went in actually having had a heart, to the hospital having had a heart attack. So by all medical accounts, it's clear that his body will not experience a dramatic healing. However, our prayers have been and continue to be answered. God's perfect will is being done. We don't know what God's plan is for him, but we do know that ultimately he will be healed. He will receive complete healing as he enters into the presence of his father, his creator, almighty God. And God's will be done. God's best for him and God's best for each and every one of us. So we, like Solomon, in our Old Testament reading, should acknowledge that we too are children of God. Children who are in need of the Father, in need of our Creator, our Provider. Whatever, however you want to refer to God or think about God. We are all in need of that relationship. And the, and the, the care and assurance that comes from trusting in the one who, who loved us enough to create us in his image and to love us regardless of, of however it is we behaved toward God's creation. We need God to be God and acknowledge that so that we can be God's people, so that we can be God's children, trusting in God's mercy and love and in God's good and perfect will. And as children, we pray for God's best, God's best for the world, God's best for our neighbors, God's best for ourselves, trusting that God's will be done. Amen.